During December, 84 children were absent from Brandon Infant School, victims of measles and scarlet fever. Miss Kirkup is their mistress. Thomas Rapp Apple is headmaster. Brandon, last season's champions of the Wharton Billy League, met the runners up Silksworth, Mi Silksworth Miners All in Brandon Literary Institute. A large crowd gathered to watch the playoff of a league fixture. Great excitement prevailed. A brilliant game was played, the best ever witnessed in the Institute. For Brandon, John Pratt compiled splendid breaks of 51, 27, and 17 unfinished. Brandon players, Robert Cairns, 139. Ralph Cairns, 85, John Pratt, 150, Archie Robson, 150. Total scores, Brandon, 524, Silksworth Miners All, 521. Brandon won by three points. 1902 saw the birth of the Brandon and Vice Shuttles Cooperative Society at nearby Meadowfield. The building has a frontage of 152 feet. A butchering department has an area of 264 feet done out in glazed bricks. Upstairs is a large central hall big enough to accommodate about 600 people. The building cost about £14,000 and is lit throughout by electricity. Bannerets and streamers stretched across the street at Meadowfield presented quite a festive appearance. At 1.45pm a procession headed by the Brandon and Brownie bands traversed the principal streets. Motor cars driving wagons laden with products of the Wholesale Society were a feature of the proceedings. Of the 2,420 electors in the Brandon area, 1,094 were full members of the store on its opening day into 1903. Peter Keenan, a labourer at Brandon Colliery, died on New Year's Day at the age of 52. Brandon Colliery School is poorly attended due to the prevalence of measles and scarlet fever. William Simpson, a labourer, lost two infant sons. Thomas Jones and James White, both pitmen, each lost a son. All were victims of scarlet fever. Seven cases of smallpox were reported in Durham City. Colliery folk are fearful of the dread disease spreading. While the new school for the children of St. Patrick's Langley Moor was nearing completion, a serious fire occurred at Brandon. The wooden stable housing three horses and a large quantity of harness belonging to the Barnes' brothers was left a total wreck. Crowds drawn by the huge blaze were helpless. The three animals suffocated from heat and smoke. The brothers suffered a great loss as the stable and contents were not insured. Great public sympathy went out to the brothers in their misfortune. Tired dancers emerged from Brandon School at 4 a.m. at the end of the first March dance. The spiteful wind struck steamed up bodies. Couples were wished at home by the March gale, which whipped along at 90 miles an hour. Many scared inhabitants, awakened by the unearthly howling, dared not retire for further rest. Broken roof slates crashed to the ground. Chimney pots, bricks, Bridging and spouting were dislodged. Glass in several of the street lamps was blown out and broken by the force of the gale. Thankfully, the gale favoured the new St. Patrick's School at Langley Moor, which was opened to take up, three, take up to 300 pupils. Straker and Love, Brandon Colliery owners, kindly made a donation of £50 towards the cost of the building. Hugh McDermott, the able secretary of Brandon Science and Art Classes, Desirous of helping the funds and provide for technical evening classes, organised a lengthy concert. Artists from Newcastle, Durham and Darlington entertained a crowded central hall in the new Meadowfield Cooperative Society building. Stables to house 100 pit ponies nestled near the, the busty seam air pit shaft. Nearby, a drift was begun down to the Brockwell seam. George Miller, an 18-year-old sinker, together with the br two Bregan brothers, were assigned the task of firing and removing the debris. On completion of the arduous task, the management had about five score of busty coal tubes, busty coal tubes lowered down daily. These inferior coals were mixed with the Brockwell seams, best coking coal, and sent to the surface to feed the coke ovens. Farmer, the big horse, manoeuvred the tubes when they reached the Brockwood level, Brockwell level. Hugh McDermott, Mark Bell, John Felton, William Rutter, William Aters, John Pinckney, Michael Murphy, all miners, were vociferous in their protest to the removal of the one and a quarter
quarter percent increase in wages that Durham miners were granted just four months before. It was a red, red letter day for pony putters when their wages were advanced three pence a day. The first August bank holiday granted to miners, albeit without pay, was duly celebrated by the Brandonians. To, com to commemorate the occasion, a walking competition and sealed handicap was arranged. Ex-superintendent Burrell of the Colliery Inn gave money prizes. A local businessman, Mr. Dodgen, gave a suit of clothes and one guinea. Sixteen stockily built pitmen of varying ages, whose pale skin denoted their occupation, gathered in the precincts of the air pit. Cage pulley wheels were conspicuously silent. The route took in the station road, Brownie Colliery, Burnigal Bank, Sunland Bridge, alongside the river way to the Dairy Lane, onto Bransforth Road to terminate at the starting point, a circular race of six miles. A. Tullick was first, Masha Kennedy came in second. The winners of the Sailed Andy Cup were Masha Kennedy first, Bob Freeman second, and A. Tullick third. Some miners, especially the younger ones, talk of emigrating to British Columbia where they are promised plenty of work. With wages from 19 shillings to 28 shillings a day, a move could be lucrative. Mr. John Wilson, MP, had a letter from the President of the United Mine Workers of America discouraging men going to the Fernie District of British Columbia where wages are not high, as promised, and conditions of labour are not favourable. Work is assured George Emerson, son of George Emerson, a Brandon Colliery miner, who has been awarded a first-class certificate of competency, thus qualifying him as a mine manager. He has passed examinations each year since 1897. Tragedy dogged the Crozier family. Thomas Crozier married and living at number six single son on the street at the age of 27 was a coal over in Brandon Corrie Hutton seam. Whilst out by bound at his shift's end, he detected the approach of the fast moving set of empty tubs running in by. While showing concern for the safety of a lot following behind, Thomas was struck by the set. A very large crowd attending the pub attended the popular young man's funeral. The Crozier family has been connected with the colliery since coal was first found in 1856. Thomas's father was killed whilst at work at nearby Brownie Colliery. Two of his wife's brothers also met with a similar fate at the same colliery. Talk of the Crozier accident had barely subsided when news of 13-year-old Albert Peel's fatal accident was reported. He was an underground pony driver. As the, Christi, as the Christmas festive season approached, Edward Rumley, a 29-year-old coalhoer, was buried under a fall of stone. His death completed a trio of fatal accidents at Brandon Colliery during the year. On Christmas Eve, a conversation, conversation was started in the Colliery School in connection with the Mount Beulah Lodge of the IOGT. A good crowd enjoyed a programme of songs and other items which were rendered in first-class style. Two capital sketches entitled, entitled Wanted a Lecturer and Safe from Crime were given by the Grand Templar Sketch Party composed of brothers J. Young, Tom Clark, M. Porter, Robert Foster, J. Young and Mrs. Nesbitt, F. Skelton, A. Tynan and M. Nesbitt. Mr. J. Roxbury, newly arrived in Brandon Colliery as minister to Mount Calvary Methodist Chapel on the departure of Mr. Jenkins, was busy up to the year's end performing burial rites. He interred Thomas, the infant son of Steve Stringer, minor. The child was the 44th Colliery resident to die during the year, the majority of whom were infants, into 1904. Out of 42 applicants for the post of surveyor to the Brandon Urban Council, just vacated by Mr. J. McKenzie, Mr. George Duncan was chosen to fill the position. The appointment is worth £140 a year. He is well known in the area, having served in the city surveyor's office. Three cases of scarlet fever and one of smallpox were admitted to Brandon's hospital in the first week of the new year. There were also two cases of diphtheria from one family. Four deaths occurred with startling suddenness. R. Ewans, Tom and Edward Pattinson, all minors, each lost an infant. Twenty-year-old Catherine Kennick joined the children. After a long layoff, the pits were reopened. Jubilation was short-lived. Owing to trade disparate depression, the pits fell to work in slack time. Matt Pickford, Alf Laws, Nicola Adamson, Robert Howe, 
John Thornton, Edward Orr and Paddy Morton were among the 400 men who were put onto the relief fund. George Emerson Jr. Had not, had not long to wait for a post of importance. His workmates at Brandon Colliery presented him with a handsome rolled top secretary on his leaving to take up the more lucrative position of under manager at nearby Oakenshaw Colliery under the same firm, Strake and Low. Mr. Elwin, manager of Brandon Colliery, made the presentation in Brandon School. A pleasant evening was spent and concluded with the national anthem. Sixteen students won a total of 19 certificates at the Brandon Technical Instruction Classes. A free concert was arranged by Hugh McDermott and held in the Cooperative Hall, Meadowfield. Mr William Whiteley of Durham successfully coached the various classes for the examination. Society of Arts, Arithmetic, Shorthand and Bookkeeping being taught. The junior examination for Shorthand was held in the Brandon Miners Hall where eight students, George Dowson, W. Wilde, George Curl, F. Adamson, Thomas Green, Thomas Reid, Harold James and George Bainbridge gained Pittman's elementary certificate. They received their awards in a crowded Brandon school along with up ambulance students, billiard players, medal winners of the Hortony Spring Billiards League and members of the Brandon and District Carbine Club Morris Tube Competition. Father Thorman of St. Patrick's, Brandon's vicar and curate, doctors and local officers graced the proceedings. Doctors McIntyre and Denham attended William Barnes, a 37-year-old coal ewer. William, whilst at work, ewing a dude in the air pit, was buried under a fall of stone which severely crushed and broke both legs. He died at his home, 3 Russell Street, at 8 o'clock the same night. His widow and five children mourn his loss. The children are pupils of nearby Brandon School, which is closed owing to an epidemic of measles in the colliery. Only a month after Will Barnes's accident, another fatal accident occurred in the same scene when 23-year-old Thomas Coleman was trapped under a fall of stone. William McCabe, a putter to Coleman, notified James Wilkinson, deputy overman, who found Coleman under a four-feet square stone. He had died instantly with a broken neck and back. At the Brandon Urban Council meeting, reference was made to the proposed Durham to Brandon Tramway. The chairman said the scheme had been dropped, presumably through lack of money. It was suggested that buses run between Brandon and Durham would do a roaring trade, especially at the pier week ends. Durham city shopkeepers regret, regret the collapse of the Brandon tramway scheme, who believed it would bring them increased custom. News of the council's intention of lighting the district by means of electricity helped offset local disappointment regarding the tramway project. The estimated cost of the work is £1,893 to replace the fuel, gas and oil lamps in the area. Joseph MacDonald, James Connolly, <coughs> Bob Grimes, Tom Goundry, Tom Cameron, William Cummins and Thomas Smith, Corleos and family men, after suffering a 5% five five reduction in wages, had little money to celebrate the 33rd Miners Gala at which bands and banners moved in continuous procession from 8 a.m. to noon. Brandon Colliery Banner, one of the 89 counted in, Sil in Sadler Street, packed almost pole to pole, was played in by a proud prize silver band. The band, only two days before, had travelled to Mask, where their horticultural show held a band contest. Brandon Colliery played the test pieces, song sh Songs of Schubert and La Favorite, superbly to beat all opposition. They had also been successful at Whitton Park, having won the first prize of £8 in the band contest there. They also came a close second to win 10 shillings in the March contest. The brand solo, band solo cornetist W. Gordon won the cornet medal. Brandon Colliery once again harbours infectious disease. Enteric fever struck West Street. On inspection, only one of the houses was found defective, having a damp pantry. One of the enteric cases occurred in the house which had a cesspool under the pantry window. Ten houses were stoved out and 35 articles disinfected by steam. Disinfectants were supplied for use in the, in the infected houses. A typhoid fever victim was removed from 18 East Street to Brandon's Isolation Hospital. The two-roomed house with eight occupants, six of whom slept in one bedroom, which averages seven feet in height, 
from floor to ceiling, is one in a row of 19, sprawling a few yards from the air pit where a number of miners have just received notice to cease work. The slackness of the coal trade has seriously affected the coke works. It has meant the closure of a large number of nearby coke ovens. Little Island, comprising South, East and Railway Street, houses a sturdy Irishman who operate the coke ovens who are worried for their large families. A further outbreak of entry fever necessitate the removal to hospital of 12 of the 18 cases found in the Colliery Rose, one of whom died there. Dr Smith reported that he could not find the cause of the enteric fever, but was of the opinion that the disease had been spread by means of the open channels which exist all over Brandon Colliery. The hospital is full and the services of another nurse are being sought. West, Newcastle, Durham, North and East Streets supplied Moore's victims. 11 of the colliery's 26 streets contributed to the total. A little burnt fruiter drove his cart the one mile to Brandon Colliery. The collecting book nestling among the cart's contents proved tempting to the 12-year-old boy. He stole the book worth one shilling and sixpence. He was fined ten shillings and ordered to have six strokes of the birch rod. Geordie was in possession of an old feeble half-blind horse and a few of his friends were always poking fun about it. Meeting Bill recently, the lad asked sarcastically, Why, Geordie, how much can the Galloway draw? By Gok Shop, retorted Geordie. He seems to be able to draw the attention of all the fuels in the place. The third fatal accident of the year occurred when William Crozier, a 27-year-old coal yower in the Bay Pit, was buried under a fall of stone. Twelve years ago, the premises in Commercial Street were taken over as a workmen's club for the centre ward of the district in Meadowfield for the initial outlay of £500. Increased accommodation was needed for the 400 members. The, majority, the major portion of the work is in alterations has been helped out by members owing to the tenders for the job being too high. Some £1,615 has been spent on the club. The day's programme included a tea in the miners' hall where 600 guests were catered for. Following the meal, a concert was held in the club's new billiard room at which a gold key was presented to James Turner, the club's first president. Silver-mounted umbrellas were presented to the secretary, James Wilkinson, and the treasurer, George Winter. The fever epidemic having raged for weeks in the colliery rows shows no sign of abating. Two more deaths occurred at the end of October. One fatal case is that of Mr T. Thompson of Sunland Street, who had just completed arrangements to emigrate to Canada, but now leaves a widow to mourn his sad loss. Brandon Hospital now houses 27 enteric fever cases, three of scarlet fever, together with three cases of diphtheria. Two nurses have been engaged to nurse the victims. 17 houses were fumigated and 62 articles disinfected by steam. There was a low percentage of scholars attending Brandon Colliery School owing to the prevalence of whoop and cough, typhoid, typhoid and scarlet fevers. The drains in Western Durham Street are in a very bad state. There is need for sanitary reform in Brandon Colliery. It is known that there are people living on the top of drains, which in the event of heavy rains burst through the ground floor, compelling the residents to take flight to the upper rooms. Householders have heard that such conditions foster diseases of every nature. One of the finest streets ever, ever was given in Brandon School over Christmas, when the Mount Beulah Lodge IOGT gave its fifth annual conversation. The programme consisted of songs, humorous recitals, duets, dances and sketches. 74 of Brandon College's old people were admitted free to the front seats. The four-day event was concluded with a substantial tea for the old folk. On New Year's Eve, the Colliery School was once again the time of activity when 500 sat down to good things provided by the lady members of St Agatha's Mission. Games and dancing were indulged in afterwards to make their annual social a success. Into 1905. In a New Year, New Year game, Brandon Institute played Langley Moore in the Horton League Billiard Series. J. Pratt, W. Cairns, J. MacDonald and A. Robson each scored 150 to beat the visitors 600 to 401. St. John's Church draws a good number of worshippers from Brandon Colliery to satisfy the needs of a going congregation 
The church was thoroughly renovated and enlarged. A north aisle being added at a cost of £4,000. The church now seats 450. Mary Jane Hunter bid her husband Thomas good morning. Thomas, a 46-year-old deputy, left his home in Queen Street for, an, for another shift in Brandon Colliery Seapit. He was jo drawing in due to 10.30am, some two hours after leaving home, when a fall of stone engulfed him. Ralph Rumley and Thomas Robson, both coal ewers in the First West District of the West Flat, recovered the body in half an hour. The large concourse of mourners attended his funeral in Brandon Village graveyard. Tragedy followed tragedy. 17-year-old Philip McKenna, a strong 17-year-old pit lad, who was assistant on set in the bay pit. His job was to help unload the empty tubs from the cage and replace them with full tubs of coal for removal to the surface. He lived in Tooth South Street and was a member of the Catholic Drum and Fight Band. His father, Philip McKenna, is chairman of the United Irish League. Young Philip, whilst at work, was fatally crushed between the cage and the shaft bunting. On March the 8th, followers of John Wesley, who since 1872 assembled every Sunday in one of Brandon Collery's two cottage houses, two room cottages, celebrated the laying of the foundation stone for a new church in the Station Road. Three months later, on June the 12th, the new Wesleyan church was opened. The building cost £1,500 and holds about 200 people. Builders were again busy when the library of the Colliery Institute was enlarged. The Institute, a much-used building, caters for the literary needs of the 582 who worked the collieries A, B and C pits. Three MPs attended the 35th Annual Miners' Gala, one of whom was Keir Hardy, a great fighter for miners' rights. Brandon Collery Banner was among the 89 banners which could be seen at one time from Durham's Saddler Street. Meadowfield Cooperative Society opened a kinema showing films and variety shows. Patrons from Brandon Colliery and District are now spared the journey to Durham, hitherto involved when such entertainment was sought. William Underwood, at 28 years of age, had worked underground since the age of 12 when he left Brandon Colliery School. He lived in the Long High Street and you would call in the air pit. Thomas Hewitt, a putter, ran William's empty tub into the Ewan place. Thomas had gone some 13 yards with a full tub of coal when he heard William Underwood shout. On returning to the place, Thomas found him dead. He had been almost buried under a fall of stone. William was the 40, 47th fatal accident victim of the Colliery's 49 years of existence. 50 years of age. Colliery buzzers, as usual, announce the entry of the new year, a year during which the colliery celebrates its 50th year of existence. Three seams employing nearly 600 men, 26 streets with their hundreds of houses, innumerable coke ovens, four chapels, a school, two inns, a workmen's club, literary institute, a street of shops, a weekly market, and gigantic colliery spoil heaps have emerged since the first sod was lifted almost half a century ago. Hundreds of families have drifted into the colliery. Some stayed on. The majority, nomad-like, ventured further afield, some of whom even elected to seek work abroad. A railway was nearing construction as the first immigrants arrived. Those who chose to settle, to watch, to work and watch the colliery grow, experienced a major colliery strike and soup kitchens, distress and sorrow in the wake of numerous epidemics, shock and overwhelming sympathy at the time of the seepit explosion when six lives were lost. They expressed horror when crimes of passion claimed the lives of two victims, pride on the safe return of volunteer soldiers from the African Boer War. Businessmen Robert Ray and Matt Bates, both publicans, John Edley and John Longstock grocers, Andrew Glass and Thomas Long, also grocers, Green and Willis Drapers, Barbara Margin Butcher and the Workmen's Club, all looped to the day, the Orton, Crosscuts and South East Districts, naming but a few of the many scattered seams at the colliery work full time. Success in their business is centred on the thriving colliery. 
The Literary Institute is a haven for out-of-work miners where drafts, billiards, dominoes and library book reading are indulged in. There was great excitement when the intrepid Colonel Cody manoeuvred his flying machine over Brandon Colony. The aeroplane was seen to descend in the vicinity of Pitt House. 21-year-old Paddy Moran, Billy Miller and a number of temporarily unemployed miners excitedly ran the one and a half miles to give Colonel Cody a towing start. Amid cheers and much hand-waving, the machine passed over Osher College and eventually arrived at Newcastle Town Moor. An expectant crowd gathered in the colliery field to greet the arrival of the diminutive pit pony on whose flat cart perched the huge ball. Ample ropes held the sphere, its bulk overflowing the sides of the carriage. Brandon United football team, a challenge crook united to a game of push ball. Cheered on by their many supporters, both teams finished the game in a state of physical exhaustion. A drawn game was deemed a fair result. John Lee and Thomas Graham descended to the Hutton Seam at 4 p.m. At 6 p.m. the two men, both stone men, were taking down stone to make height for the following shift. The premature fall of strata covered both men, John Lee being killed outright and his workmate seriously injured. Nicholas Westgarth, another stone man of 3 Albert Street, on returning with a hand saw he had borrowed, found the hapless men. John Lee, the 27-year-old miner, left a widow and a baby in their Newcastle Street home. Hundreds of mourners walked in procession the three miles to Red Hill Cemetery in Durham for interment. The pit claimed yet another victim when Isaac Robert Shaw, a 23-year-old coolio in the sea pit, was buried under a fall of stone. The accident occurred at 5 a.m. Despite all our rescue work, his body was not recovered until 8 a.m. When Brandon Connery Banner with black drape fluttered in memory of the recent fatalities, was carried aloft at the 36th Annual Miners Gala, which drew a record crowd of 90,000. It joined the banners from 190 lodges to Grace Durham's race course. Accidents occur despite the fact that some seams are closed and others are on short time. On August the 30th, the colony claimed its 50th victim in 50 years of working when at 10 minutes to 3, 25-year-old Joseph Hoyle was killed. He rode in the empty set with eight of the men from the shaft of the Ballarat seam in the sea pit. At the third west of takes, he jumped from the moving set to be hit by the rear tubes. Local churchgoers lost the services of two popular clergymen when the vicar of Brandon, the Reverend W. Ransom, left for missionary work in Zanzibar, Africa, and when the Reverend Joseph Thorman left St. Patrick's Langley Moor to take up duties at St. Andrew's in Newcastle. Father Thorman had in his last week at Langley Moor seen a beautiful new altar pitted in the church. During his eight years at Langley Moor, he had seen new schools built and a big organ installed in the church. The Reverend Harry Hayward, BA of the Royal University of Ireland, was inducted as Brandon's new vicar in time to perform the Christmas services. He took up residence in the vicarage standing in Sawmills Lane into 1907. John George Fenwick, petticoat swirling around his short legs, ran from number 33 Sunderland Street. He unerringly crossed the road and the wide rock strewn street to Durham, to Durham Street's number 46, where Hannah Rutter lived. He sought his usual treat. John George's father, Will Fenwick, had retired to bed after his early shift at the pit. The child's mother worked in her kitchen, blissfully unaware of John George's intentions. Hannah's brother Thomas, a coal ewer, after his bath in a, in a tin set before the fire, the bright red fire in the big grate, had ascended the stairs to bed. The time was 1.30 in the afternoon. He had worked the foreshift. It was wash day. Hannah, with the week's wash ready on the table, lifted the large pan of boiling water from the fire and put it on the kitchen's mat-covered floor. Like a magnet, the glowing fire drew John George, his small arms extended for warmth. He stepped back and fell into the boiling water. Thomas Rutter, on hearing the splash and screams, rushed downstairs. He applied olive oil, sweet oil, lime water and whiting to the child's injuries. Dr. McIntyre found the child so terribly scalded he ordered his immediate removal to hospital. The flat cart 
horse drawn, left deep roots in the January snow as he began the three miles journey to Durham. On the cart lay the badly blistered body of John George Fenwick, born just two years and three months before. 600 men and boys employed at Brandon's A and B pits handed in their notices. They had been held on in the Union Hall. After bitter argument, the drastic strike action had been decided on. The dispute over wasn't over wages. The miners had just been awarded a wage increase of three and three quarters percent. There was friction over the employment of miners who are non-unionists. Three men had refused to join the union. Twenty-eight men had let their union fees lapse. The rule allowed no more than three missed fortnightly payments. After ballot, the majority favoured striking. Tom Carr, head of Brendan Brandon Miners Union, said it was not a question between master and men, but one solely confined to the miners. Two weeks later, just as the notices had expired, the strike was settled. All but one of the 28 men had paid up their dues to the Union. A new cemetery served the Brandon and Byshottles area was acquired at Meadowfield. At a cost of £2,700, it is large enough for 5,000 single graves. It is expected to last about 30 years at the present rate of burial. The council bought five and a half acres of land from Lord Boyne at a cost of £150 an acre. Tom Gibson and his wife were the oldest standards of Brandon Colman. Their connection with the primitive Methodist movement reached back some 59 years. After burial service by the Reverend Joseph Rogsby, Mrs. Gibson was interred in the new cemetery at Merrifield. She was the first Brandon College resident to repose there. For ten years, Brandon's gas had been fed from Durham. A new form of street lighting emerged when Straker and Love erected a power station at the colliery from which electricity was generated to all streets, back and front, in Brandon Colliery, Brandon Village, Brownie and the Meadowfield. Dismal by roads and back streets were little. Dark corners of east and west streets, the marketplace and corner ends were illuminated and made safer for the pedestrian. Miss Ram Ramsey, daughter of a pitman, lived in the colliery roads. She had attended Brandon School before training to teach. She was appointed superintendent in the MIGS department in the school just a short walk away. At the same time, Miss Florence Anna Thiel was promoted to headmistress of the infant school at a salary of £100 per annum. Mrs. Hayward, vicar of Vicar Hayward, dis distributed prizes for good attendance at the school. Fifty-six children received books. William Green, Draper, stood again for the centre ward of the Brandon and Byshot Reserving District. He has been a member of the social of the council since 1894, during which time his motto has been the greatest good for the greatest number. He refers that during the last three years, over £8,000 were spent in new sewage works, bridges, electric lighting, a new cemetery and other projects. Some months after the departure of the Reverend Joseph Thorman from St. Patrick's Long Nimmerwell, Catholics and non-Catholics subscribed to a testimonial fund. During his parochial leadership, he made many friends in Brandon Colliery and gave generously. His gifts took the form of an oak file pedestal and a purse of gold from the parishioners, and a polished oak spirit and smoking cabinet from the teachers and scholars of the school. James Murphy, Norris Woodward, Philip Lynch, Jr., Thomas Williams, John Tunney, Frank Tunney, and James Duffy, all Pittman Limon and Brand Brandon Colliery, were married during the year. Patrick Moran, now 22 and a Colliore, lived at number 20 Railway Street. He married 21-year-old Mary Cummins, a whale from nearby 19 South Street. They had, they had attended the same school at Langley Moor. Into 1908, on January the 6th, crowds gathered in the hitherto quiet village of Bransbeth. 77-year-old Gustavus Russell, the eighth Viscount boy who died on December the 30th, was buried in the, in the family vault in the corner of the little churchyard. His own Bransbeth Castle towered over his resting place. Viscount Boyne owned a vast tract of land which included Brandon Colliery from which he drew, drew royalties from coal mine there. He left more than 600 thousand pounds. 
Mud Bates had been landlord of the Red Lion Inn, affectionately known as the Blazer, for 25 years. A great sportsman, he was very popular in the area. On his retirement from public life, a concert was held in his, in his public house. Hugh McDermott, Brandon's Union Lodge chairman, for the past 20 years, presided at the gathering. A gold-mounted walking stick, silver snug box and a mounted guinea were presented to Mud Bates. His daughter, a teacher at Brandon School, was under the beautiful gold brooch. John Meeman played the piano. Hugh McDermott sang, as did other six artists, to make the night a memorable one. The Coleridge miners look to a brighter future. A new Act of Parliament has just been passed, which states that no man is to work, is to work more than eight hours out of 24. It is called the Eight Hour Act. Good news too when Durham Miners Association join the Miners' Federation of Great Britain. Twenty-year-old Miss Florence Pilling was engaged to teach at Brandon School, where Miss Bates teaches twelve-year-old Billy Miller. Changes too at Mount Calvary Methodist Church. Mr. R. Walton took over as minister when Mr. Rogsby left after five years' service. John Boyle of Sunland Street, Michael Tunney, Newcastle Street, and William Graney, also from Newcastle Street, all young miners just recently married, are bitter over the coal owner's decision to reduce their wages three and three quarter percent. Some nine months ago, the county's miners had, after long negotiation, been granted an increase of seven and a quarter percent. Careful household budgeting enabled music lovers to acquire the popular machine, the phonograph, much used at weddings, receptions, for two pounds ten shillings. Sound is recorded on wax cylinders and is played by winding up a clockwork motor. George Burton, 47 years old, husband of Anne Burton, left his West Street home after breakfast to join Joseph Bell, another coal to work to work double in the pit. During the shift, a large stone fell on them as they worked side by side. Joseph Bell luckily escaped with a scraped back and bruised arms. The falling stone on striking George's back and neck killed him instantly. Into 1909. Good news for the elderly. They no longer dread outliving their savings. From January the 1st, an old age pension was given to all over 70 years of age with an income of less than 10 shillings a week. A couple will receive 7 shillings and sixpence and a single person 5 shillings a week. Heavy January snowfalls cost Brandon Urban Council 18 pounds 3 shillings and 4 pence. This was the sum expended in clearing the roads, the snow plough being out, certain blocked parts too deep for the plough had to be dealt with by hand. The council, needing an ambulance, accepted tenders for a vehicle. Tea fast tender from Bishop Auckland for £55 was chosen. The tender was the lowest of 22 sent in from various parts of the county. Three Brandon Colliery pitmen left Durham Police Court after being fined for fighting and disturbing the Christmas peace. One was heard to say, I haven't a Meg. Another remarked, We cannot change our shirts. The magistrates frowned severely from the bench upon the prisoner in the dock. It was the fifth time the same lad had been before him for poaching. Do you realise, said his worship, turning to the boy's father, that this boy of yours has been before me too many times? In fact, I am thoroughly tired of seeing him here. Not half so tired as me, said the father. Then why don't you take him in hand and teach him the right way? I've shown him the right way, said the disgusted parent, but the young fuel always guns and gets catched. Almost every week, sea trains pass through Brandon Collard Railway Station, carrying miners and their families en route to Australia. Miniature flags are waved from carriage windows. Men and women search for the acquaintance likely to wave to them emigrants. Men tired of the condition prevailing in the coal trade, after saving from their meagre wage and selling off furniture, have managed to raise the £17 required as fare for the six-week sea voyage. Devastating news reached the colliery on February the 16th. West Stanley Colliery, one of Durham's pits, suffered a terrible explosion in which 168 lives were lost. A number of Brandon Colliery pitmen recall the anguish of the much smaller disaster which struck underground at their colliery some nine years ago. 
On the day of the West Stanley disaster, 13-year-old Billy Miller descending the pit for his first shift. He had, he had left school where Miss Bates had taught him. He was immediately set on for Corrie. The wooden cage swayed alarmingly in the day shaft as Billy descended. He started as a flatter and spent 10 hours collecting tubs together in the flat as putters brought them from the coal face. Pony drivers took the full tubs out to the main landing prior to removal by the out by all to the shop bottom. Brandon Corrie's Silver Prize Band gave a sacred concert to help alleviate the distress left in the wake of the West Stanley Pit disaster. The band marched through Brandon Corrie and on to the Central Hall Meadowfield, which was kindly granted free of charge for the occasion. The musical treat was poorly patronised, as only two pounds one shillings was collected. Easter Saturday, Norman Smith, aged 11, and eight-year-old John Tullock left behind the colliery rows and wandered through the maze of coke ovens to the disused quarry where deep murky water had drained after heavy rainfall. The younger lad, on reaching for bird's eggs on the quarry side, overbalanced and fell into the water. Norman jumped into the rescue. The coke ovens surrounding the lonely quarry effectively cut out the lad's tragic cries for help. Pittman, Gavin Parkin, John Walton, Jonathan and, and Tom Stevens were relieved and delighted when Lord Collins, sitting as umpire to deal with the dispute which had arisen between Durham's coal owners and miners of the county with reference to, the, to wages, gave his verdict. The coal owners contended that circumstances justified a reduction of 7.5% in the men's wages, while the men's representatives offered to accept a reduction of 5%. Lord Collins' award is in the following terms. I award and determine that the Durham Coal Owners Association are not entitled to claim any deduction from the said current rate in wages. After long agitation by the council representative for the said award, Mr Green, Mrs Straker and Love wrote to the council stating that they had built 401 new ash closets at Brandon Colliery out of a total of 685 and would continue to build the others at their earliest convenience. Best suits and bonnets were charmingly displayed as their owners thronged the road from Brandon Colliery to Meadowfield, where the Vicar of Brandon had 105 candidates ready for confirmation in St. John's Parish Church. The proud Reverend Award greeted the Bishop of Jarrow on his Whit Sunday visitation. Choirs from St. John's, St. Agatha's and St. Catherine's stirred the packed church as they entered singing Onward Christian Soldiers. On the same afternoon, Brandon's Silver Band headed the Sunday School Union Parade and accompanied the hymns at the service held in Morton Park. The band gave a concert on Dur Durham's race course, Bandstand in the evening. A fine program of music was rendered. Ewers, offhand men, stone men, deputies and bandsmen of, Br of Brandon Colliery donated 36 pounds, two shillings and sixpence which the Brandon Union Lodge sent to the Stanley Pit Disaster Fund. On Monday, June the 21st, the two putters ewed in double in the Brockwell Sea Pit. 18-year-old John O'Neill and William Prudho of Sunland Street, after their shift at putting, decided to earn extra pay. It was midnight when they began ewing in a spare place in 3rd West District. A roll in the roof loosened and fell on John O'Neill's legs. He died at 6 a.m. in Durham Hospital. Two days later, James Auburn, a 30-year-old married man of 3 North Street, was busy packing stone in his workplace. He had, he had half an hour of his shift to work. A stone, four foot long, two feet broad, and 14 inches thick fell on him. The pit was again laid idle according to custom pertaining to fatal accidents. Brandon and Meadowfield Social Club held its second annual sports. School children residing around Brandon and District met in Commercial Street where the club is situated. They are formed into ranks and marched to the field 1,200 strong. On entering the grounds, each child was presented with a bag of sweets and a penny to treat themselves to any of the amusements there. Sonny Brow beat Brandon Stars in a competition for a set of medals presented by the club. The football was watched by an enthusiastic crowd. On big meeting day, Thomas Atkinson of Brandon Colliery took his turn with his pony and trap in the Hackney carriage rank at Langley Moor. Business was always good on the day, 
when all traffic seemed Durham bound. He was fined two shillings and sixpence for not having a license number on his plate on his trap. Robert Jackson was fined one pound in costs for a like offence. Brandon Connery's Silver Prize Band in cracking form visited New Bern on Tyne to enter the band contest promoted by the Spencer Steelworks. The band won two first prizes and a total of eight pounds in cash. They also took the New Bern Challenge Cup valued at 30 guineas and medals for soprano, trombone, euphonium. Six first prizes and one third had been won in the space of five weeks. Curry folk turned out to cheer when the band paraded the streets before holding a smoker in Beatty Biddle's Colliery Inn where an excellent supper was served. Thomas Condren, Condren George Lee, Hugh McDermott, John Clennon, George Winter and Thomas Lee were coffin bearers at the funeral of 55-year-old William Harwood, Czech women at Brandon Sea Pit who died suddenly. He was held in high esteem by management and men alike. Workmen bore aloft the black draped banner, usually reserved for fatal actions at the colliery. Continued on side 12. George Emerson, at 67, had worked 53 years for Straker and Lowe. Born in 1842, he began his pit career at the age of 14 on the opening of Brandon Colliery. He worked 28 years as heapkeeper for the A and B pits up to his recent death. October, October saw a typhoid fever epidemic in Brandon Colliery. 30 cases of the disease being reported. The isolation hospital is full. John Elliott, a 25-year-old son and street man, died from the fever. The day following his burial, his mother, Mrs. Elliott, succumbed. Another son, Simon, aged 19, died shortly after. Another son, Charles, is prostrated at the hospital. The, the bereaved husband lost his wife and two sons within a week. 120 old folks celebrated Christmas in style. Workmen of the A and B and C pits gave them their annual tea, where each couple received 15 shillings and each single person was handed five shillings. Carol singers were busy touring the streets on Christmas morning until midday into 1910. Workmen employed at the A and B pits resumed work on January the 24th. They had been on strike since January the 1st. The dispute, the county one, was named the eight hour strike. Brandon Workmen's Social Club financially aided the needy cases arising from the dispute. Members of the club received a shilling for each child and the same for their wives. Tickets varying from two shillings to ten shillings were given out to them. The Cooperative Society had a busy time next day when about 300 tickets were handed in for supplies of groceries and meat, the total amounting to about £60. On the next day, club officials were again busy when tickets were given to anyone off work, but the members of the club are not, who were affected by the dispute, a sum of about £120 being disbursed, which alleviated many sad cases of distress. The coal owners again sought reduction of the miners' wages. The latter agreed to arbitration. Lord MacDonald's award was that the reduction be six and a quarter percent. This award leaves wages 33 and three quarter percent above the basis of 1879. Due to slackness in the coal trade, four of Straker's six pits are idle. Only Brandon's two pits are at work, albeit only three or four ships a week. Viscount Boyne made a gift of 1,500 square yards of ground close to St. John's Church for the purpose of building the parochial hall. The vicar, the Reverend H. Hayward, said it wasn't exactly a gift. They had to pay the sum of five shillings per year for 99 years. He introduced a free will, offering, a free will offering scheme. Around the same time, a plan for a new Catholic church at Langley Moor to accommodate the large number of Catholics in the Brandon area was passed by the Urban Council. When King Edward VII died, Friday, May the 20th, the day of his funeral was observed as a day of mourning. Brandon Colliery was idle for the day. Men at the collieries could ill afford the loss of wages, A slack time was again amongst the rule. Services were held in St. John's, St. Agatha's and St. Patrick's. H. A. Ward, G. H. Ellis and G. Parker are the respective ministers. 
the Cory called to the Cory streets, ringing his handbell and declaring to all that the pits are idle the morn. Brandon pits were not working on the Saturday owing to slack trade. The loss of a day's wage <coughs> did not prevent the happy exodus from Brandon Colliery Railway Station, the occasion being the annual excursion promoted by Brandon Social Club. Club officials had been busy on the Friday night handing out tickets which if bought at the railway station would have cost the recipients two shillings each. Between 3,000 and 4,000 departed from the station in four packed trains which visited Tynemouth and Whitley Bay. Never was such a crowd left, never was such a crowd left the colony in one day. It was minus gala day and Jack, having taken too much bad beer, was lying drunk when a policeman approached and said, Come on lad, get a move on. Is there now where he is, lad? asked Jack. No, who are you? Asked Jack Smith, say, say. What, are you a county councillor? Why, not a county councillor, as a colliery caller. Owing to the strike of northeastern railway workers, business in the Brandon district were greatly inconvenienced. The cattle purchased by butchers at the market had to be driven the 16 miles from Newcastle. Local butchers collected their beasts at midnight. Robert Felton and Thomas Lawson left Brandon Colliery, their vociferous companions acclaiming the coming contest. On their way to do battle, they had passed the Red Lion Inn where Mad Bates had reigned as mine host for some 27 years. His lamented death leaves a vacancy on the Durham Board of Guardians. A game of fives had been arranged between the two Colliery men and two Landy Moor men, Pat Malall and Frank Burns. Spectators paid thirteen pounds thirteen shillings gate money to watch bet and cheer on the four contestants. The game, thirty-three up, was played for a stake of fifteen pounds a side. Brandon men cheered as Felton and Lawson went eight chalks up to their opponents too. Joy was short-lived. The Langley Moor players won by twenty chalks. They had been warm favourites to win. Two pitmen, William Allen, deputy overman of Cobham Terrace, and George Winter, miner of Sunland Street, elected to stand as Brandon sent awards representatives on the Durham Board of Guardians. Out of 883 electors, only 284 residents decided to exercise their franchise. The result after the voting in Brandon Colliery School was George Winter, 152, William Allen, 129. There were three spoiled papers. Parishioners of St. Patrick's Langley Moor, long in need of a bigger church, most of whom came from Brandon's 26 rows, were jubilant on hearing of the proposed new church. The edifice will be faced with stone, will consist of nave and aisles, sanctuary and apsidal end and side chapels. There will be two sacristies attached to the church. The interior will show an arcade of five arches to each side of the nave, resting on octogonal column columns with foliated capitals. The roof will be an open one of armor beam construction. Electric lights will be installed. In the last game of the cricket season, Brandon travelled to Durham City. The city declared with a score of 113 for eight wickets, then skittled Brandon for 55 runs. On October the 1st, crowds converged on Langley Moor. A sixpence admission charge meant a good view at the laying of the foundation stone. Thirty-two years have passed since the corrugated iron building to serve as school and chapel was built. Bishop Collins laid the foundation stone of the church which will cost £3,000 and seat 450 It was a red-letter day for the Catholic community of which Father Parker is leader. He has £1,200 in hand, £170 was raised during the day. Pittman who are parishioners continued to contribute a day's wage every fortnight to help pay off the debt incurred. Edmundsley heroes were drawn against Brandon United in the Brandon Nursing Cup. A poor crowd saw Dave Oakley and Will Ramsey score two each for Brandon United whose better football produced a 6-2 result. The United are also in the Durham Central League lying second behind Durham Rovers. In the first round of the DNS and District Age Minors Cup Langley Moor Temperance played Brandon United to a 2-2 draw. Goodall, Pennington and Bowes played well for United in a hard game. Brandon, still in form, beat New Bransford Villa 
two won in the Brandon Nursing Cup competition. In the Durham Hospital Cup, Langley Moor St. Patrick's versus Brandon United attracted a good game. It being too dark for extra time to be played, the game finished a goalless draw. Dave Oakley was prominent for the United. Selway in goal for St. Patrick's saved two penalties in a hard fought game. Jordy was supporting the home football team. During the match, he was shouting to the referee to watch the game, get his eyes choked, etc. At half time, the referee went over to him and said, Look here, my man, who was refereeing this match, you or me? Jordy looked him up and down and then replied, Neither of us. Christmas entertainment was assured when the Boyne Electric Theatre was opened. The new Royal Hippodrome, built of wood and covered with corrugated iron, holds 800 persons. It costs £1,000 and is fitted throughout with electric radiators. A splendid orchestra, all local talent is engaged. William Jackson bass, T. Chadwick cornet, T. Green flute, E. Meeman drum, Miss Hartland penis. Excellent pictures were shown and variety of performers also contributed to the entertainment. Prizes of Christmas Fair awaited the winners of the annual billiards, domino and card handicaps promoted by the Committee of Brandon Literary Institute. The games were as usual well attended. 120 old people received their annual Christmas cheer when Brandon Lords distributed £74. Each couple was given 15 shillings and a single person 10 shillings. Carter Watson, James Wells and Joseph Reynolds all Brandon Colliery Pitman had cause for double celebration. Their marriage dates coincided with news of a wage increase of 2.5%. Several houses now boast a gramophone which is played to good effect over the festive season. His master's voice is the popular choice. It costs £3.10. Shillings. Other makes cost £1.05. Shillings. Dry, fine weather favoured carol singers and the local band when they patrolled the district. All places of religious worship were well attended. Into 1911. Clusters of men and boys waited patiently. A heavy fall of snow announced lounging figures ready to spring into instant action. Muffled males swarmed the 25 streets the colliery boasted. In spite in scores of the 704 houses in Brandon Colliery, built and owned by Messrs. Straitman and Lowe, sat man or woman or both ready to respond on hearing the knock on their door. Buzzers of Brandon, Neighbour and Littleburn and Brownie Collieries, as per custom, heralded the new year. Their raucous, albeit joyful sound, set off the midnight scramble. Where the cacophony had ceased, first footers had entered their chosen house, others taking potluck ran from door to door, hopefully shouting, Happy New Year, Mrs. It was New Year's Eve and the colliery buzzers had ceased. Geordie sat by the fireside, holding his ferocious dog by the collar, waiting patiently for his chosen first foot. Suddenly, a low, timid voice shouted through the keyhole, uh, Happy New Year, mister. Is that the old Bill inquired Geordie? Yes, lad, has they got the do dog tied up? asked Bill. Why aye, how we in? Didn't be frightened, replied Geordie. I just give him a good feed afore the buzzer blew. Brandon sent a ward as a population of 4,732, consisting mainly of colliery workers and their families. The Durham County Council published its report on the sanitary circumstances and administration of the Brandon and Bishop's urban district. The medical, the assistant medical officer reports, Brandon Colliery, Numbers 1 to 21 Railway Street, defective floors and roofs, causing dampness, low attics poorly lighted and ventilated, no stared lights, pantries improperly sealed, small yards defectively paved, insanitary open channels. Numbers 1 to 33 South Street, three room houses, small kitchen and low attic, badly lighted and ventilated, yards small and defectively paved in sanitary open channels. Numbers 34 to 64 South Street, two roomed houses, low attic bedrooms, approached by step ladders and defectively lighted and ventilated. Poor pantries and defective paved kitchen, 
small kitchen floors, small yards, defectively paved in sanitary open channels. These houses are not reasonably fit for habitation. Numbers 1 to 20 East Street similar to proceeding. Numbers 1 to 40 Sunland Street similar to proceeding. Numbers 1 to 38 West Street two room flats with defective floors, defective paved yards in sanitary open channels. Numbers 43 to 82 Newcastle Street two room houses, no stared lights, small yards, defective defectively paved in sanitary open channels. Numbers 1 to, numbers 1 to 41 High Street, numbers 1 to 60 Park Street, numbers 27 to 52 Princess Street, number, numbers 1 to 52 Albert Street, similar to proceeding, also in sanitary open ash pits as previous in Park Street and Albert Street. Numbers 1 to 23 North Street, Two room houses, step ladders, two attics which are badly lighted and ventilated, no fireplace, no stair lights, poor pantry accommodation, defectively paved ground floors, small yards defectively paved, insanitary con conveniences and open, open channels. These houses are not reasonably fit for habitation. Numbers 26 to 42 North Street, three room houses with defectively paved ground floors. Low attic bedrooms defectively lighted and ventilated, no stair head lights, no fireplaces, <coughs> small yards defectively paved, insanitary conveniences and in open channels. Slaughterhouses, premises were for, more, for the, were for the most part attached to butcher's houses and gen, generally were located much too close to dwelling houses. For instance, I was surprised to find that slaughtering is permitted on the premises of a house in Station Avenue. A new row of small self-contained houses in Brandon Colony. Most of these, most, most of those that were inspected were clean, but some premises in Commercial Street, Brandon Colony, were in very bad order. Isolation Hospital. This is a temporary structure of poor design, situated close to Brandon Village. The two wards, the kitchen and the accommodation for the staff, are under one roo the one roof. Each ward is stated to have a capacity of 4,000 cubic feet and is therefore suitable to hold two beds that is adopting the usual standard of 2,000 cubic feet per bed. This accommodation is inadequate and it is also unsuitable for the treatment of two or more infectious diseases concurrently. Disinfection in cases of infectious diseases, liquid disinfectants are supplied by the District Council and the occupiers of the houses concerned are instructed to, to disinfect all washable articles with the same. The houses are also fumigated under the supervision of the sanitary inspector with sulphur. At the isolation hospital, there is a small single engine steam, steam engine steam sterilizer on wheels. I understand that it has not been in use for some months. It should be re repaired, or preferably a larger disinfector, which could be used for articles such as bedding, etc., should be obtained. The Reverend James Courtney Bevan of Durham University moved to his new post in Brandon Colony. He's curate in charge of St. Agatha's Mission Church. The church adjoins a plot of land designated for another row of houses next to Cobham Terrace. With engine wheels barely visible behind escaping steam, a lengthy stopping train to King's Cross halted at Durham railway station. A pale-faced young man, tall and smartly dressed, entered the compartment occupied by three men, all mature in years. The train eased away from Durham. Its wheels soon acquired a regular rhythm. Are you going fast, Sonny? inquired one of the trio. The young man fidgeted and put a hand in his jacket pocket. Reassured, he replied, I'm going to the plate ends, the end of the line, meaning King's Cross. One of the friendly passengers suggested a game of cards to while away the time on the long journey. Some, mi some miles on, the young man eyed his winnings approvingly. There was talk of playing for higher stakes. Much higher, <coughs> much higher, the three older men seemed keen. A perceptible slowing of the train <coughs> announced its approach to a scheduled stop, York. As the train braked to a halt, the young miner pocketed his winnings and said, Gentlemen, this is where I get off. As he sought anonymity, anonymity 
In the departing crowd, he withdrew from his pocket a third-class return rail ticket to York. Paddy Moran, a 26-year-old coal ewer in Brandon Collery's air pit, four years married, had left his wife Mary, three-year-old Nora, and baby James, one-year-old, at home while he did the York races. His recent windfall enhanced the day's sport. George Cook, the deputy in charge of the Sea Pit 2nd West District, showed signs of impatience and swore as he left his kist and headed for Colio at Ellis Reed's place. Thomas Bullows, a putter, was filling a tub of coal in Ellis's cable. It was the end of the shift. Other Colios were homeward bound. Come on, Ellis, and you, Tommy, remonstrated the deputy. We are late. The three men began their walk to the shaft button. They travelled in single file. Strong wind fanned into the districts, struck their faces. A sudden reduction of the air velocity warned them of something amiss. George Cook was worried. Normally, the wind blew with force, being only about a mile from the shaft. A solid wall of immovable stone barred their path. The only way to the shaft was effectively, effectively blocked. All, the, all three men, shocked but in no immediate physical danger, pondered their predicament. How long was the fall? How long before their absence would be discovered? Horrific thought shared by the trio, did the men who left earlier escape the fall of stone? Ellis Reed carried a blunt pick. The pick sharpened on the surface would have it ready for Ellis's next cold human sheet. He energetically wrapped on the metal wheel a primitive SOS which if the would-be rescue, rescuer puts aid to the rail, Canadian tombs plead for help. No early reply was expected as their absence would have as yet gone undetected. Three oil lamps missing from the day's issue warned the lamp cabin attendant of possible mishap. The search party descended the mine. <coughs> Meanwhile, George Cook kept Ellis and Thomas busy renewing timber in the area of the fall, more to occupy their minds. On reaching the fall, one of the rescuers jowled the metal wheel. The call was immediately answered from beyond the barrier. Were all three men safe? Volunteer Corio was descended. It was agreed to skirt alongside the fall of obstinate rock. Eager men, scantily clothed in vest and shorts, with expertise, hewed and timbered in relays. After six long, agonizing hours on the removal of twelve tubes of coal from the narrow confines of the two-foot 10-inch seam of coal, the 12-yard long fall of stone was bypassed. Immediately, the joyous news was conveyed to the surface where the worried kin of the rescued men waited. Hot coffee was sent down to call the hungry men. 210 pounds was raised from the penny rate. <coughs> On January the 22nd, George V was crowned King of England and the Commonwealth. The children of Brandon Colliery, aged from 3 to 14 years, were each presented with a coronation mug and provided with a tea to mark the occasion. The long hot summer attracted swimmers. The colliery ponds were a handy distance from the colliery roads. 33-year-old Bob Gillis, a miner and a strong swimmer, was found drowned in one of the reservoirs. At 9pm, crowds saw his lifeless body drawn from the water and carried to nearby 7 Sunman Street. On Sunday, October the 8th, the new Catholic Church was opened at Langley Moor, the foundation stone of which had been laid on October the 1st last year. Solemn High Mass was celebrated. Brandon Collery's Catholics formed a large part of, of the packed congregation. The mission was founded 35 years ago. John David Egans of Queen Street, my Catholic Jens of Railway Street, Morris McAloon, of Whitsunland Street, Mary Sarah Ann Brown from the next street, Durham Street. A double wedding took place when two sisters, Catherine and Jane Condren of Queen Street, were wed to James McIntyre and Peter Harrison so respectively. Theirs was the first nuptials performed in the new church by Father John Parker, a very happy minister. The local football team, Brandon United, smarting from last year's defeat at the hands of or feet of Langley Moor Temperance, were avenged when they beat them before a large crowd of home supporters on Christmas Day. Christmas was a happy time for 198 old people, an increase of 76 upon last year, when each couple received 11 shillings and 7 shillings was given to each single person. 
The manager of a small colliery gave an invitation to all his workmen to attend a Christmas dinner. One of the guests, a young collier, seated himself at the end of the table. Presently, a large dish, consisting of a couple of odd geese, was brought in and placed in front of Geordie, ready for carving. Why, by gox, said Geordie to the waiter, she's rather biggish plateful, but you better I'll try me best to do it into 1912. Josh Pibers, Bob Sterling, Will Carr and Archie Robson, Brandon Collier's best billiards players, had a game on with Langley Grove Club. Brandon team had good support and they travelled to the Grove Club, set in picturesque scenery alongside the River Brownie at Langley Moor. All four Brandon men scored 150 each to finish worthy winners, 462 to 600 shorts. Brandon Workman's club has sufficient members with skill to form a billiards team, one which will keep the institute side on its metal. Thomas Sorn lived at number 3 Church Street, a newly built street in Brandon Colliery. Had the street been built last year, the intention was to name it Coronation Street. Church Street is apt as St. Agatha's Mission Church is set near the end house of the street. Thomas married Jane Ann Dodds from Pramangit and Durham. James Cummings, 55 Sunland Street, Another Brandon Colliery miner, also where the family would grow. Amy Chicken. Eddie Lynch and E. Corwood were able MCs when 150 couples crowded Brandon Colliery School for a benefit social. The proceeds of the night were handed to Ralph Kell, who had been unable to attend his employment for about 15 months. Unrest over, mine, over men's wages reached boiling point. The country's miners struck on March the 1st. They wanted a minimum wage. On that day, anxious men and boys saw 73 ponies drawn from the air pit and 39 from the sea pit. The, on the onlookers wondered how long the ponies would roam the quarry field. Ponies drivers knew that their charges would be quite handful when they returned underground after layoff. The men's last working pay was drawn on March the 8th. Private purchases of coal just before the pit stopped, had to pay 100% from the ordinary price of coal. At Brandon Colliery, the price advanced from 12 shillings and sixpence to 25 shillings per tonne. Miners carried what was left of their coal allowance into their houses, as coal houses had already been cleared of their contents by pillagers. Women, worried for their families and feared a long strike, had laid up provisions for a few weeks. Some miners have stored two sacks of flour, most of so most have stored one and a half sacks. Time seemed to press very monotonously for many of the miners, some of them standing in groups at the corner ends while others stroll around the countryside. Those who make a hobby of gardening are taking full advantage of the enforced holiday to put their plots in trim. Brandon Colliery was one of the 200 lodges comprising the Durham Miners Association to share in the payout of the first fortnight strike pay. The total disbursed was £114,000. After three weeks of lethargy, the miners of Brandon and District amused themselves in earnest. A singing contest was held in the Miners Institute. Brandon councillor Tom Carr presided over large attendance. About 500 spent a thoroughly enjoyable time. George Trailer and Jim Millward were judges. Jim Welsh won the first prize of five shillings worth of groceries. Tenor Joe Litster came second to win a three and six watch. Third prize, three shillings worth of groceries, went to J.W. Brown. Fourth prize, a shirt value of three and six, was won by A. Goodall. Auntie Cairns came fifth, his prize being three shillings worth of mutton. Sixth prize, three stone of potatoes and half a pound of tea was won by Ralph Rumley. Seventh, Tom Conley, a random comedian, won two and six worth of goods. J. Blankensop won the final prize of two shillings worth of goods. Next day, a gozy please race was promoted. The route round the colliery streets was lined by cheering colliery folk who encouraged the contestants taking part. Thomas Lee, William Eyre, Charles Poughton, William Rowe, J. Stratton, John McCall, Henry Blankensop, John Carr, Frank Lynch, Edward Moses Chance and Thomas Smith, all Brandon colliery men, did not figure among the winners. Mr. Carney came in an easy first. On the following day, sports were promoted by the eminence men of the colony. 
A football match was held, racing and skipping were freely indulged in, again good crowds followed the events. Coals are becoming scarce, every day hundreds are seen at the tips seeking the precious mineral. All sorts of vehicles are used to convey the spoils, flat carts without the horses, barrows with wobbly wheels, and old perambulators are put to unaccustomed use. The Central Oil Meadowfield Picture Company have reduced their prices to half, and hams are given away to those who give the nearest number of persons in the hall on certain nights. These prizes are most welcome to many at present in the district. The final result of the Durham Miners' ballot on the question of resuming work was available on Wednesday, April the 3rd. The wording of the ballot being as follows. Are you in favour of resuming work pending a settlement of the minimum rates of wages in the various grades by the district boards to be appointed under the Mines Minimum Wage Act? The result of the ballot was for, for against resuming work 48,828 for resuming work, 24,511. Majority against resuming work, 24,317. As the majority fell short of the two-thirds of the vote, which is required by rule, the men accept that it is returned to work. Brandon, Cowrie, A and Bay Pitts voted 264 against resuming work, with 179 for. Meadowfield C. Pitt or Sisters Pitt voted 83 against resuming work and 75 for. At Brandon Colliery, the news of the settlement of the strike on Saturday April 6th was received with a certain amount of indifference. There were many expressed satisfaction at the executive's ballot. Brandon Miners will resume work as soon as the management are ready. On the day before the announcement of the strike's termination, Good Friday, 400 children started to arrive at noon for a 4 p.m. tea. The Station Road Wesleyan Church Sunday School superintendents, teachers and other fr and their friends helped to feed the hungry gathering. Each child received an orange when leaving the church. Soup kitchens were active during the strike, Brandon and Medifield children being fed in the former miners' hall. It cost an average of two pence per child for each breakfast, consisting of tea, currant bun, with unlimited bread and butter. After 37 days of strike, all pits were at work once again. The new act became operational. Coalio's minimum wage is, is fixed at five and sixpence per day. Under 16 years of age, two shillings per day, and from 16 years to 18 years, two shillings and ninepence per day. The stoppage have flung one million men out of work, the largest so far in any dispute. News of, of an advance of three and three quarter percent in wages the last one being nine months ago, came as the men settled down to work. The current increase is to last three months. With time on their hands and with little money in their pockets, striking pitmen gathered in the field adjoining the blaze of food. The summit of the quarry spoil heap, lacking a watcher out, became a vantage point for PC Ward. Eighteen Brandon quarry men were turned six poorer when they were fined for playing pitch and toss. William Rutter, Nicholas Adamson, Thomas Hewson, Robert Gill, James Robson, all miners and other workers at the colliery took part in the ballot. No friction with management or owner this time. They sought a weekly payout of wages instead of the present fortnightly pay. Their efforts bore fruit. A majority voted for the weekly pay. On August the 24th, there was a scraping loaf conceded their request. Men and their women folk welcomed the weekly set of the pay. Patrons of the colliery inn, while seated in the bar, viewed the building activity nearby. The colliery owners decided to greatly enlarge the premises near the air pit shaft. A high structure destined for use as a storehouse and rear cabin was in course of erection near the colliery ambulance room. Temperance legislation. At the, at the weekly meeting of the Mount Beulah Lodge Brandon Colliery, the following resolution was submitted by Brother G. E. Chance, the electoral uh, superintendent, that this meeting relying on the promises of the Prime Minister to introduce a bill on the lines of the 1908 licensing bill in the lifetime of the present Parliament, respectfully and earnestly urges the Government to bring in the promised temperance measure as the first bill of the session of 1913 and to secure its enactment. The resolution was accepted and recorded.
Jody had been in Bargain and on his way home had accidentally dropped into a temperance meeting where the lecturer had a very red nose. Of course, the highly coloured condition of his nasal organ was brought about by indigestion, etc. But Geordie was in dis disinclined to believe that and passed many rude remarks about it. At last, the water one was fed up and shouted wildly in the direction of Geordie, That man will make me angry in a minute. I'm not often put out, but when I am put out, you may be sure. That is closing time, yelled Geordie triumphantly. Scarlet fever and other diseases once more haunt the colony rose. Six cases of scarlet fever from three worms were being treated. Four cases of the fever and one of enteric fever were removed to Brandon Hospital. One case of erysipelas received home treatment. The new parish hall adjoining St John's Church reverberated when the first parish social gathering took place. The Reverend H. A. Ward and Mrs. A. Ward led six couples in the first dance. 24 items kept the perspiring dancers engaged until 2 a.m. Earlier, a hat trimming competition for men, a nail driving event for the ladies, a dining contest for the men, and a baked cake competition helped make a most enjoyable day. There were 79 applicants for the post of student stewardess for Brandon Colliery Social Club at a, at a salary of five pounds five shillings a week. Mr. and Mrs. Bell of Gateshead were selected, William Isles of Brandon Colliery being second choice if needed. In a club not far from Durham, a party of workmen were discussing their late steward, who had been dismissed when a traveller for a well-known brewery entered and began making inquiries about the change of stewards. Turning to one of the men, he remarked, I believe, I believe there have been some serious discrepancies in your late steward's accounts. Is that a fact? No, he replied the man. There was now been the matter that way. He never had a wrong word with anybody, but leaning forward in a confidential manner and whispering, but the Nars was about 13 pounds short. For the early in December 31st, 1911, average tons of coal drawn from Brandon Colliery seen per day, A pit busty, 713, B pit, 609, C pit, 367. Total, 1,689 tons. 139 was employed in the Bay Pit yield 3.68 tons of coal per man shift. Naked lights were in use in the Bay Pit, coals of oil being used. The 590 safety lamps in use in the A and C pits, 320 were secured by lead rivets and 270 by screws. Coals drawn for the same period a Pit Busty, 209,449, Ballarat, 459, Bay Pit Hutton, 1,707,422, C Pit Grockle, 88,650, Ballarat, 20,036. Total calls, 496,017, Fire Clear, Sega, 8,934, Total, 504,951 tons. Total number of coal drawing days A pit 294 and a half, B pit 291 and a half, C pit 296. Total 881 and a half days. Number of horses and ponies in A pit 73, in the C pit 39. Into 1913. New Year's sorrow gripped the Graham's home. Joseph Graham, a truck loader at the colliery, was fatally injured when he was crushed between trucks. Intense cold and slack work at the colliery greeted the colliery inhabitants on the dawn of a new year. The cooperative society and local tradesmen are complaining of sluggish business. They are hoping for an improvement in the coal trade. 1,300 underground and 417 surface workers man the three pits comprised in the colliery. Mr. T. L. Alvin is the colliery manager. John Gilgill Christ, second class ticket. George Moore, second class. And John Dakers, also third class, are respective under managers of the A, B, and C pits. Mr. R. L. Weeks has, for a number of years, been straight to the agent for their group of collieries. The A pit sends up coal for commercial and manufacturing use from its busty, Ballarat, and three quarter seams. 
the bay pit yields similar coal from its only seam the Hutton, while the sea pit provides the commercial and coal and manufacturing coal plus fire clear for the making of bricks from its Harvey and Brockwell seams. Anxious men, a good number of whom had just returned from the pit and had sacrificed much needed rest, filled the miners all to overflowing. Councillor Clark chaired the important meeting. Only a limited number of coal was and putters were needed to supply the demand for coal, hence the convening of the assembly. Worried and tired faces, creased with smiles as names were drawn from the cap. Management and men agreed that in fairness all ewers and putters names be placed in the cap and drawn at the most convenient time. Lucky men hastened home to put an end to the family anxiety. They had gained a reprieve. Gentlemen, this is the last place to be drawn for. Only one more fortunate and, and delighted workman. The rest being left in the cup. All the unlucky miner could say to his de dependents was, I was left in the cup. After years of brand and colliery, several colliers and their families left after the men had been set on at one of the newer coastal collieries. Most emigrant pitmen dislike lifting their roots. Their wives have to make new acquaintances. Their children have to settle in new schools, and they themselves have to adapt to new working conditions and workmates. Two miners having got work coal you at a colliery started on the Monday. They happened to be working near each other. On the same morning, the old man went into the first man. Where's in here? he asked. A stranger, said Geordie. The old man said, How many has to fill? Geordie replied, This is my first one, half full. Where's this chappy who's in thy side here? Geordie replied, That's another stranger. How many has he filled? Why, nay, he'll fill none yet. He's just been along to me seeking a bit of coal for the hard burn. Glorious May sunshine greeted the troop of colliery folk as they left their homes. The, str the, the throng consisted mainly of miners and their wives. The younger generation had gone diverse ways. Brandon colliery workmen, like their counterparts across the county, had elected to ease the lot of their retired miners. They followed the Brandon colliery silver band and the unfurled lodge banner to the assembly point midway between the colliery and Brandon village. Lord Boyne provided the site at a nominal rent on which to build 12 homes for aged miners and their, fa and their wives. The foundation stone for the row of one-storey dwellings was laid. Over £500 had been subscribed toward the, towards the estimated cost of £15,000. Three days after the ceremony, many of the miners' observers at the function had to be hastily, had to be hastily withdrawn by another route from the bay pit. An electric wire fused in the shaft and set fire to bunting. Burning timber caused dense smoke. Mr. Elwin, the colliery manager, was promptly on the scene. His timely action prevented what could have been a disastrous accident. Hawkers are regular visitors to the colliery rose. Grainy the paraffin man, as his regular customers among the bay pit miners, his oil is favoured for their lamps. Blocks of salt for sale are carried from house to house. Mussels sold by the pine are sold in similar fashion. Billy Thompson sells yeast to the, by the two penneth from the large square basket carried on his good arm. Billy, a Brandon colliery lad, has a paralysed arm which prevents more strenuous work. Tommy Arker, another industrious local man, shovels in the miners' coal allowance at two pence a load. The band and banner toured the streets for the second time this year on the day of the Durham Miners' Gala. Crowds left with the banner en route for Durham's 43rd gala. Good weather welcomed a record attendance. All 200 banners connected with the Durham Miners Association were there. Shortly after the big meeting, miners of the county were awarded an advance of 3 and 3 quarter percent on their wages. Nine pence in the pound increase in wages can mean as much as one shilling and six pence extra to take home. Joiners and masons were busy in North Street and West Street where all staircases were completed. Stairs replaced the stepladders which had been in use about 50 years since the rows were built. Sunland and East Streets are shortly to follow suit. The services of the colliery band and banner were once again called upon when only four months from the laying of the foundation stone the aged miners' homes were ceremoniously opened. 
Poor weather greeted the day. Councillor Carr introduced the colliery agent, Mr. R. L. Weeks, who wandered over the quays to, to the new homes which faces south and are delightfully situated adjoining the road leading to Brandon Village. Twelve grateful and happy couples look forward to settling in their new residence which have a porch overlooking a garden and a cluster of fields. People throng the road outside Holly Garth, the residence of the colliery manager, Mr. T. T. Elwin. The large house lies just above the New Year's miners' homes. The colliery band and drum draped in black turn, turned out. The band played the dead march, whilst the cortege escorted the, the popular manager's body to Brandon Village for burial. 53-year-old Mr. Elwell had, up to a few hours of his death, attended to his managerial duties at Brandon Colliery. John William Dixon, John William Richardson, James Burns and Joseph Condren were among the Brandon Colliery pitmen to marry during the year. Mary Ann Condren, Joseph Condren's sister, married William Malall of Langley Moor. Brandon Colliery men attending their meeting in the Miners' Hall heard of the fine edifice to be built. The Durham Miners' New Hall is estimated to cost £21,357 and will occupy a site not far removed from the present hall in Durham's North Road. Well-stocked shops drew seasonal shoppers despite the stormy Christmas weather. Beef in abundance at sixpence to ninepence a pound, mutton at sixpence to tenpence a pound, potatoes eightpence a stone, rabbits at one, three, one shilling and threepence each, and apples from twopence to fourpence a pound graced the shops into 1914. Continued on side 13.